This is the Bartholomew Town Podcast. All right, everybody, what's going on? Welcome into another edition of the Bartholomew Town Podcast. I'm your host, Bill Bartholomew. Today, a conversation with Corey Jones of the Black Lives Matter Political Action Committee here in Rhode Island. And obviously, plenty to discuss with Corey, who brings a really interesting perspective to the table, being from outside of the region and now immersing himself in Rhode Island politics and action. And of course, we dig into school reopenings, which has its own challenges surrounding equity and just broadly challenges when it comes to students, teachers, parents, administrators, you name it. It has been an interesting week. And many of you have been following along on the Bartholomew Town Podcast social channels. You can follow me on Twitter at Bill Bartholomew or join the B-Town Facebook group. You can also find B-Town on Instagram. I've been covering the reopening. I've been with Providence Teachers Union President Mary Beth Calabro, Commissioner Angelic Infante Green, Mayor Alorza, Superintendent of Providence Schools Harrison Peters. And I've also heard from a lot of you out there about reopenings. We're hearing, okay, in Sharaho, things are going well, both virtually and in person. We're hearing differently when it comes to Providence, where earlier this week I reported the first positive case of a staff member inside the district. Also problems with the distance learning aspects of Providence schools. But look, all the challenges, we know there's going to be significant learning curves for everybody involved. And when it comes to the health and safety aspect of things, though, that's really where we're going to try to keep our full attention. So if you have any information out there, how's back to school going for you on your at Bill at ripodcast.com. Coming up next week, we're going to have Rhode Island Education Commissioner and Helica Infante Green on the program. We're also going to hear from Bob Walsh, who runs the NEA here in Rhode Island, and other voices. So really trying to quadruple down on the school coverage. You can listen every Wednesday as well to the governor's briefings all the way back to March. I've been there for every press conference except for a couple of them, and I've really been pushing the school reopening challenges. I've heard from a lot of Providence teachers. I've heard from a lot of teachers from other districts, and look, there are significant concerns, and we're going to stay on them, and that's really the only thing we can do at this point is try to get a better understanding of what's going on inside the buildings, all right, and and what efforts for mitigation, prevention, and response are taking place. That's where the focus really has to be. You know, it can't be on the fairy tale side of things where we just assume everything is going to go back to some kind of normal. Yeah, there'll be some positive cases, but in general, it's not a big problem. But we also don't want to go overboard and just assume that the whole thing's going to be a disaster. We need to look at specific examples of where there are challenges that are not being met. You may recall last week I mentioned that I spoke with several inspectors who have been looking at the buildings. I've spoken with them off record, and they have said, look, there are major problems that can't be fixed. You know, if you want to put ventilation systems in some of these buildings, well, there's not sufficient power supply. If you want to open up windows and put box fans in, well, some of the windows don't open more than just a few inches. So, Look, we're going to have to give this some time, sort it out. Again, next week we'll have the Commissioner of Education on, who I spoke with earlier this week, and they're trying to spin this as optimistically as possible. I don't fault them for that, but we also have to be honest about this conversation and and look at it from the perspective of what exactly is being done, and is that enough, and what more can we do? And just keep asking those questions, okay? And assume as well that for all of these outdoor learning elements, you know, the windows being open, this, that, and the other, right, that this is a short-term solution because, look, by the time we get to the winter proper, even, you know what, this past couple of days ago, I was out and I realized, man, I have to put on the long sleeve shirt. We are here. Can't tough it out anymore. Going to have to get out of the flip-flops pretty soon. It's almost time to start thinking about, you know, getting chilly and um, the outdoor solutions just aren't going to cut it. So, All that being said, B-Town on top of everything when it comes back to school, live streams, podcasts, and uh, and more. So stay tuned. And again, if you have any information, it's bill at ripodcast.com. I would be remiss if I didn't remind you that you can support the local, independent journalism, opinion, analysis, entertainment, and more that B-Town has become known for here in the Ocean State by becoming a B-Town insider. To do so, head over to patreon.com. Slash Bartholomew Town for as little as three dollars per month you can sustain this program, and for ten dollars a month you can become a B Town Insider receiving exclusive content. The last uh, couple of weeks we've had, pardon me, the last couple of months we've had uh, we had Dr. Luis Daniel Munoz on giving us a breakdown of where things really stand with coronavirus. A medical doctor who ran for governor, he knows the medical side, he knows the public policy side. He gave us the inside scoop. Last month we had the Publix Radios. 
Ian Donis and WPRI's Ted Nisi on talking presidential election, right? And uh, that was interesting stuff. This month, September, I'm breaking out the old guitar. I've got some Rhode Island politics songs for you. It's not as dreadful as it sounds. It could be entertaining. We'll find out. It may be a failed mission. We'll find out. But become a B-Town Insider by visiting the Patreon page, patreon.com slash Bartholomew Town. Okay, with that all being said, let's get right to it. Corey Jones, Black Lives Matter Political Action Committee here in Rhode Island. All right, so t- let's talk about um, exactly what you're doing in- as far as getting, you know, an action, political action going for on, on the Black Lives Matter side, you know, which has existed as really, you know, in the activist space, it's really existed in the cultural space. Mm-hmm. And certainly there are elected officials who have brought either the spirit or the, even the policies of Black Lives Matter into certain uh, context, whether it's on the local, state, or federal level. But tell us about ex- exactly what you've got going on here. Yeah, so we we basically came to the agreement that the Black Lives Matter movement is inherently a political movement. Um, so we decided that we should be taking a political perspective. Um, the Rhode Island Latino PAC um, has been around since the 80s. Yeah. You know what I mean? So the work that they've done is amazing. Um, and you know, when we decided to create this organization, we kind of looked at them and, and seen how they've been able to uh, play a role and amongst the other packs in Rhode Island. So we decided that um, we had a role to play and specifically working uh, for all people of color, uh, black, brown, uh, but from an intersectional land. So uh, we believe that um, our role is to focus on issues that are specifically affecting people of color. Uh, So right now we're focusing on education. Uh, So we have a a list of demands that we're elaborating on and and we're breaking it down to kind of see what it looks like. Um, But those kind of demands, you know, range from um, working with RIDE to reform some of the the, uh, certification processes the admin cert processes, I mean, creating alternative pathways for teachers to get licensing. And um, we plan to kind of find a, innovative ways to create um, pipelines of teachers of color, right, to kind of fix, you know, disparities that we see in uh, Providence public schools, but all over, you know. So uh, that's kind of the lane we wanted to take. I got connected with the BLM movement. Um, Cause I moved here from Iowa and I got connected with brother Gary and I told him kind of what I envisioned in a pack. And he, you know, gave me his blessings to, you know, start this organization uh, like youth led and, and do our own thing uh, regarding, you know, the pack. Um, so that's kind of how we got started. Um, I recruited Josh and Joyce. Joyce is our executive director. Um, and Josh is the chair of our advisory committee. So we created our advisory committee, which is basically a body of community activists. We've asked, you know, all type of, you know, people who have had prominent influence in this movement uh, to join. Some have, some haven't. Um, and we've used that to, to guide us um, in endorsements and also in how we allocate our resources. That's fascinating that you're, I mean, it makes a lot of sense that you'd focus on education out of the gate. And, and, and really the, the issue of teachers who reflect their community is something that right. nationally is, is, is a conversation, certainly here in Providence. I know Rhode Island College mm-hmm. has tried to step in and, and find ways to remedy that. And mm-hmm. it's something that I find, you know, you listen to the talk radio or whatever, the statewide conversation. It's not something that a lot of people shockingly not a lot of people seem to get or understand how important that Mm -hmm. is um so it does make it makes a lot of sense now what about um in the context of you know you look at right now providence public schools and central falls um Mm -hmm. tucket woonsocket there are major infrastructure challenges there as well what what are you doing about in, in that department so to speak yeah so we we think that you know these candidates that we support going into the Senate um, and into the House is, is really important regarding, you know, how we um, allocate funding. So I think that the Rhode Island General Assembly is going in the right direction. We had some big wins. Uh, we endorsed, you know, David Morales. We endorsed Tiara Mack. We endorsed Brianna Henrys. Uh, we endorsed Megan Coleman and 
all looked like they pulled away with a pretty big win. So, you know, when we endorsed Tiara Mack at first, we had a lot of people that were, you know, for Harris and, uh, I mean, was for Mets and he, they contacted us and they're like, yeah, why, why did you do this? Um, and, you know, we, cause you know, we had to make a bold stance, even though some people that, you know, we had been working with were connected with them. So I think that it's not going to be easy because a lot of times um, people become buddy, buddy with, you know, certain politicians and then it makes it harder to work with other people but I think that, you know, we just have to be strong. Um, so we have to work with the right people on certain reforms, but then we also have to work to unseat certain people that might not be allowing that progressive change to happen down from the, um, from the budget down to these municipalities, because that's really the reality is that we're going to have to have state funding to kind of catch up on some of these school infrastructure problems. And that's a long-term problem. Uh, that's a long-term, you know, goal, but in the short term, we can get some low-hanging fruits um, with, you know, the ride with the Rhode Island Department of, Ed of Education, and then going into the legislative session, we can get some funding done. Yeah, that's the formula right there. You nailed it, no question about it. And Matt Brown, one of the coordinators or founders or whatever you want to call him of the Rhode Island Political Co-op, told Ed Fitzpatrick over at the Boston Globe that this most recent election was a political earthquake in Rhode Island. Do mm -hmm. you get the sense? Cause I look, I've, I go through periods of thinking, boy, are we, are certain parts of the state or certain people anyway in the state disconnected from the reality on the ground? You know, when it comes to the core issues facing people of color, facing people in poverty, so on and so forth. But then you have some of the results that, we saw in the, in the primary election, you go, okay, maybe people are starting to by and large say, look, we need to lift up everybody in this state for it to function as well as it possibly can. Do you get the sense after the primary that things, are you optimistic things are heading in a direction where at least the conversation, the debate is going to get away from, you know, hysterics about, oh, this protest, somebody, uh, or this riot, someone lit a, pol a police car on fire, you know, tur and turn towards the actual issues more and more. Do you get that sense? Yeah, I think that, you know, when you unseat, you know, a 35 or 36 year uh, senator, right, you, you really shake up the establishment. I think that what happens is, you know, um, I, so I took, I'm a political science major, so I took a class where we studied um, basically, it was a women in politics class, and it was about the difference in women of color um, that are LGBT, uh, but intersectional campaigns versus um, non-intersectional campaigns. And they found that, you know, women of color were more likely to find innovative ways to, to get the win uh, rather than, um, you know, other people that were not intersectional. So I think that what we're seeing is um, more attributed to skill rather than, uh, you know, a, a necessary, um, you know, fear, I guess. I think that what's happening is that the progressives are kind of creating their own machine and they're, they're learning how to, to turn a completely numbers game into uh, um, innovative strategies to win, you know, so... Uh, when you think about it, these races are, you know, short, they're 200, 300 vote races, and it's really just a numbers game. Um, so when when you pull together the numbers, you know, we are we are growing in numbers, but also we are becoming smarter in our execution, you know. So I think that that was kind of a, a wake-up call for us to look back on what happened in, in 2016 and, and go, okay, this time, even though we're late in the game, we need to play a role in this. You know, we need to uh, find an avenue and, and help in any way we can, whether it's contributions, whether it's press, social media, um, whether it's hanging up posters. We've hung up po about 50 different posters in businesses across Providence um, with our endorsed candidates. So, you know, we just felt like, the machine for the progressives is kind of formulating and um, it's becoming a real threat because in Rhode Island, the numbers are so small that it's really a conquer and divide game. Yeah, no question about it. There's, there's the, especially in the primaries, you know, the numbers are not 
massive and you can, you know, you're seeing some votes that are set or some races that are separated by a couple hundred votes and are now right. definitive wins or losses, depending on who, who you're talking about here, even as we wait for mail ballots to be returned. So I completely agree with that as well. The ground, that's one of the unique things about Rhode Island is that, you know, I grew up here. I, I, I also studied political science at URI and then I was gone for a decade. I was in Brooklyn and, you know, being involved as a community organizer there or, you know, in politics, whatever it is, you know, you realize when you get back to Rhode Island, wow, you can attain so much here because we're so closely knit and there's a lot of diversity within the state. It's just about right. getting everybody on board to say, hey, look, this is how we want to move forward. And you either can be on board or you can be looking from from behind. And, um, right. you know, so it's, it's, it's a fascinating place to do this work. I want to talk about um, COVID-19 and, you mm-hmm. know, Look, different zip codes in Rhode Island have experienced this this virus in completely different ways, and there's fundamental reasons for that. And I think we all know it at this point. You know, um, I'm here in Elmwood, zero two nine zero seven, a lot different than what you're going to get in zero two eight one three in Charlestown, Rhode Island, down by the down by the beaches. And there's fundamental reasons for that. Where do we begin going forward? We're going to have a resurgence of this virus almost certainly at some level. So what can we do now to prepare for that? And then, of course, just broadly health equity going forward. Yeah. So um, like I said, I'm from Iowa and um, a little bit of a, you know, blast of what's going on in Iowa. So about a week ago, Iowa had 2,600 cases. So I was roughly three times the population of Rhode Island, but it's very spread out. Um, So the resurgency is, is real there. My dad has COVID. Um, my, you know, about three of my friends from college and high school have COVID. Um, I have, you know, I know probably about 10 or 20 people that have gotten COVID in Iowa. So it it really, um, hits home when you look at this situation. So I think that Rhode Island has gotten a hand on it, but I think that we have to keep a hand on it. And I think that, uh, COVID has really showed us, what an intersectional movement mean, uh, because when communities or marginalized communities suffer in times like this, they suffer to the biggest degree. And um, a lot of times this is new to people. They're like, well, why are people of color getting COVID more? Why are, you know, but the reality is, is that, you know, people of color suffer the most when you look at any type of, um, you know, injustice, just because they're already suffering. So it, it, it makes it, you know, they're less likely to be able to quarantine. They're less likely to be able to now rely on someone else. They're less likely to be able to be further away from people. So I think that this really shows us that when we talk about injustices for people of color, we have to look at all injustices and you can no longer say, you're pro-black, but you're not L- pro-LGBT black, right? You can no longer say that you're pro-black, but you're not pro-climate, right? So I think that COVID is a highlight of this. And it's something that you can't deny, something you can't run away from, something you can't argue around. Um, and But I think that this is kind of how all of the crumbling infrastructure of, of the system that we have has, you know, fell on our most vulnerable population. Discover over 200 episodes of Rhode Island's podcast of record, the Bartholomew Town podcast on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you get your pods, or head over to our website, ripodcast.com. Yeah, we've seen that. And, and certainly it's been known well beforehand. I mean, here in Rhode Island, Dr. Nicole Alexander Scott created the health equity zones and mm-hmm. we did that well before COVID for sure. I think three, four years beforehand. But yeah, what's fascinating is that even as the testing sites have gone in and that we start to see some baseline infrastructure, there's still not a lot of, you know, br- uh, brick and mortar health facilities that are being built. So again, it goes back to that, just like in the schools, it's like within the halls of general assembly and particularly in finance, just getting people on board to physically construct better infrastructure that's more equitable. So, and and, and how long that takes, who knows, but um, at least you're pushing the boulder up the hill and not just giving up. (laughs) You know what I mean? Yeah. And see, um, 
you know, I, we jumped into education and I actually decided to, to take up a role as a substitute teacher. Um, so I'll be subbing, you know, going into the school year because I felt that at this time, you know, that the teachers really got the, the sore end of the stick. You know, um, when, you, when you look at the situation where the, the students can decide if they want to come to school or not, um, but the teachers can and the teachers might be our most vulnerable population. Um, so, um, I think that, you know, there's not really a right answer in this situation is because the, the, the teachers, while they're doing the right thing, the kids are gonna, you know, get the worst end of this, of the situation. If, if we can't figure this out. Um, but I think that right now is the time to, you know, step up, not just as an activist, but you know, volunteer to, you know, substitute in these classes that might not um, have a, a teacher because the teacher might be a vulnerable population. So, um, or even because the teacher might live, you know, around a, a son or a husband who's, who's vulnerable to this virus. So I, I know that the CDC is ramping up to um, do vaccines on november 1st yeah come on right <laughs> <laughs> and i'm like i'm like man like two days before the elections and you're gonna have to uh get herd immunity <laughs> yeah let's let's see how that plays out i certainly won't be on 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 the front of that line to say the least you know right and see the thing is they play they play these kind of mind games with us right where you know, anyone in their right mind and health knows that they're not going to be able to um, end the pandemic, right? And the instant the vaccine is ready and two days before the election. Um, but, you know, they kind of, they give that deception that, you know, things are going to be under control and you don't have anything to worry about when you go in and vote. So, and, you know, we see some of this going on in Rhode Island too, you know, um, with these schools reopening because it, it's like, um, Gina said that we still have old buildings. They'll just be disinfected. <clears throat> right. You know, it's, it's, it's like we need to do better, you know, because, because when we put these students in a situation where they can hurt someone, you know, in their life, like that's something that you'll never forget. You'll never forget if you gave your your grandmother COVID and she she passed away. Like, could you imagine being, you know, a 12-year-old kid with that on your conscience? So it's like we have to uh, consider the, the traumatic situations we could be creating, right? Because I know personally my mom and dad both have high blood pressure, right? My mom has diabetes, right? If, you know, like we said, you know, people of color are the most likely to suffer when it comes regarding health, right? So how can we put a student of color, right, who's more likely to have people who are vulnerable in their household in a situation to um, pass that virus on to them and cause a traumatic experience that that child will never forget? Yeah, it's, it's a total injustice. And look, you know, it, it, we're going to find out very soon, I think, as as Providence particularly tr figures out how they're going to navigate this, but statewide, you know, and and look, mm -hmm. I've talked to the inspectors or part of me walk through personnel that are mm -hmm. going into the different buildings uh, off record. Um, and I even mentioned it to the governor yesterday during during the weekly press conference. Hey, look, a lot of these schools, you know, you can't install the upgraded fil air filtration because it, they don't have the physical power supplies right. to handle you can't install box win fans in the windows because a lot of these schools they're the old crank window that you'd have to just rip the window out and install permanently install a fan and then what are you going to do when it's november so it right. goes on and on and i know in a lot of cases people are working hard i've heard from principals and superintendents that are saying hey look we're doing the best we can and we feel mm -hmm. fairly confident but nonetheless it is um, it is definitely a situation in in particularly in certain communities that you you know you we have to keep an eye on and be ready to act immediately the second that things I mean they already seem questionable at best right now and no right. doubt about it, it gets worse than we have to pull the plug. Yeah, I think that we the reality is we're going to have to spend some of that COVID money 
yeah. um, on schools. I think that, you know, um, I know that the, the, the students are going to suffer the most if we have to go online. Um, but I think that the reality is maybe that's a good opportunity to upgrade these facilities. You know, so whether that happens this year, that happens in the future, I think so, that COVID money is going to have to play a role in um, fixing those problems you just laid out. Because if we can't have adequate circulation in the buildings, then what is disinfecting? What is anything else when the air that we are breathing is infected, yeah. right? So, and, and you can't have children breathing in chemicals because, you know, I, I'm asthmatic. So I've been in classrooms that have triggered my asthma because there's so much uh, Clorox sprayed, you know, so that yep. goes into play too. Um, you need, you know, good air filtration. You know, there's no way around that. Yeah. So if anyone wants to get involved, what, you know, making a difference pushing for some changes in the Rhode Island Department of Education. They can go to blmripac.com and sign up to get involved and make a donation. I, yeah, I've, I've watched about 20 or so episodes. Oh, awesome. It's, kinda, it's, it's played a good, it's played like a blueprint for me to kind of create uh, key players and who I need to connect with and where we can connect with on different projects. So awesome the platform is huge man i just want to let you know coming from iowa to rhode island i've been able to really catch up on the last two or three years well i appreciate that a lot this is the bartholomew town podcast hey rhode island bartholomew town is your election central stay tuned for election coverage all through this autumn and with any tips or information you may have send me an email bill at ripodcast.com at HealthSource RI for Employers, we provide access to health insurance to more than 1,100 local businesses and nonprofits, and 96% of them renew through us every year. Maybe it's our choice of 19 different health plans, our 10 years of customizing solutions, or our one local team of dedicated experts helping employers find quality health insurance. See how our numbers stack up for you. Learn more at healthsourceri.com/employers.